Hello, and welcome to Met Speaks, Indigenous Communities and Environmental Justice. My name is Anne Meisinger, and I'm an assistant educator for public programs and creative practice at the Met. As our ongoing lecture and conversation program, Met Speaks always brings together a rich spectrum of voices and speakers on our special exhibitions and permanent collection. I'm privileged to be speaking to you as a guest in the ancestral homelands of the Canarsie people and respectfully acknowledge the Met's location in Lapanoking, the homeland of the Lenape diaspora and historically a gathering and trading place for many diverse native peoples who continue to live and work on the island. It's a tremendous pleasure to be introducing today's program, which is being presented in conjunction with the exhibition, Jules Tavernier and the Ilan Pomo, currently on view at the Met until November 28th. The exhibition explores the intercultural exchange between French-born and trained American artist Jules Tavernier and the indigenous Pomo community of Elam at Clear Lake in Northern California. The show brings together approximately 60 works by a range of artists, paintings, prints, watercolors, and photographs to tell the story of Tavernier's travels through Nebraska, Wyoming, California, and the Hawaiian Islands, incorporating a multiplicity of voices and perspectives, some of whom you'll hear from today. It's my honor to be introducing Elizabeth Kornhauser, Alice Pratt Brown, curator of American paintings and sculpture, who will be guiding us through tonight's program. Betsy oversees the American Paintings Collection with a specialization in 18th century portraiture and 19th century landscape. Along with Jules Tavernier and the Ilan Pomo, she has organized a number of exhibitions at the museum, including the recent exhibition, Thomas Cole's Journey, Atlantic's Crossings. With that, I'd like to warmly welcome Betsy, who will be introducing the rest of our participants for today. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. And thank you, Anne, so much for that introduction. And thanks to you and the education staff for organizing uh, this evening's event. Um, we have some wonderful speakers with us tonight. And what I'd like to begin our program with um, is by briefly introducing our exhibition, Jules Tavernier and the Elam Pomo, uh, providing an overview um, of the exhibition itself and the themes that uh, will be further explored uh, by our speakers this evening. Um, the exhibition was inspired by the acquisition of this major painting um, that you see on the screen, uh, this French-born artist Jules Tavernier's masterpiece, which was only recently rediscovered, um, entitled Dance in a Subterranean Roundhouse at Clear Lake, California, which he completed in 1878. And it depicts a ceremonial dance of the Elam Pomo, known as Mofome, or people dance, um, which you can see is an underground roundhouse. It was commissioned by San Francisco's leading banker, Tiburcio Parrott, as a gift for his Parisian business partner, Baron Edmond de Rothschild from Paris. And the work celebrates the rich vitality of Elam Pomo culture, while at the same time exploring the threat posed by white settlers, including Parrot himself, who was then operating a toxic mercury mine on the community's um, ancestral homelands. And it would eventually uh, be designated a Superfund site uh, by the Environmental Protection Agency in 1990. The mine continues to negatively impact the lives of the sovereign people of present day Elam Indian colony. And that's something we'll be uh, exploring more in depth this evening. So I'd like to give you just a quick look at um, the uh, French Bohemian artist Tavernier's career. Um, the exhibition um, provides an overview of this formally trained Parisian artist who arrives in New York City um, in 1871. And um, he had been fascinated by the idea of the American West and uh, Native American um, 
culture while in France when he had the opportunity to see works by major American artists in that city. And when he arrived in New York, he was hired by Harper's Weekly to travel across the Western uh, Plains, where he took um, dozens and dozens of field studies. One you see at the left is watercolor uh, while he was um, actually at Red Clouds Camp in Nebraska, showing the uh, camp physician in his tent. And on the right, he's portrayed by his fellow uh, artist, uh, Paul Frenzny. Uh, there is Tavernier on his um, portable easel, taking a portrait of a Plains um, family. Um, and um, he's dressed in formal European traveling attire, which he would very quickly give up for um, a, a full cowboy hat and leather uh, fringe um, suit and boots. Our show really shows many of the highlights. Tavernier was most interested in direct encounters with indigenous peoples, and he um, had the honor of attending the Sundance ceremony. Um, and you see uh, this, this large canvas called Gathering of the Clans, um, where the Arapaho Lakota um, gathered um, for a week-long celebration. Um, and he actually includes Red Cloud in the lower right. But the exhibition really sort of moves our audience toward um, his great masterwork, commissioned, as I said, by Tuberquio Parrot, San Francisco's leading artist, um, who was running this toxic mercury mine on the Elam Pomo lands at Clear Lake, about 100 miles north of San Francisco. And um, he was able to bring Edmund de Rothschild of the famous Rothschild family to San Francisco in 1875 to interest him in, um, on, in Mercury, essentially, and took him up to see the mines. And while the men were there, there were several other French travelers, they were invited to attend the people uh, dance ceremony that evening. And it was, you know, a great honor. <clears throat> and so after that event, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Tuberquio Parrot decided to honor this uh, important relationship. He commissioned the then leading painter of San Francisco, Tavernier, who he knew well by that point, to paint this masterful work that um, honored this great um, occasion that these uh, white men were able to, um, to witness. So Tavernier spent literally two years working on this. It, um, he would travel to uh, the Elon Pomo community many, many times as reported by the San Francisco newspapers. He studied the architecture of the roundhouse. He did dozens and dozens of life studies of the Pomo that you see portrayed. There are over a hundred figures in this painting. Um, and he, you know, studied the light sources. He eliminated all signs of smoke so that he could honor the regalia, the, you know, the costumes regalia of the Pomo people, their artwork. You see, you know, beautiful, um, just wanted to situate you here um, where you see Clear Lake on the left in its um, location from San Francisco and then the site of the Sulphur Spring Mines right on uh, Clear Lake itself and a historic photo from the period. In this detail from Tavernier's painting, um, you know, what we argue in our exhibition is that Tavernier really because of the two years he spent painting this work, he wanted to honor the Pomo people and um, in the painting, he includes the presence of the white men. On the right, you see Turkio Parrot, Edmund Rothschild, and on the left, the um, French travelers. And you can see several of the Pomo figures kind of, you know, there's a certain tension as they seem to glare at um, these white intruders. And I think Tavernier was probably aware that this particular dance was intended to protect the Elam Pomo community. It was a, a dance of renewal and protection um, to ensure their existence as they confronted essentially white genocide. It had been decades of genocide against um, uh, the Pomo peoples by white settlers as they arrived in great numbers. So the irony of the painting is that um, as they were protecting themselves and renewing their culture, um, they had uh, a white intruder who was running a mercury mine on their land. So it's, it's a, such a poignant and fascinating story. 
In the exhibition, we wanted to show Tavernier's works alongside the artwork of the Pomo community itself. And we worked with many consultants, uh, two of whom we have with us this evening, to, um, to include in our exhibition the regalia of the Elam Pomo that was used in the dance ceremony. You see um, the yellow hammer uh, headband that's in our exhibition, and you see the two uh, young um, Pomo dancers wearing that, as well as a bird whistle. The beautiful ear sticks, sticks that are incised on elk horn that you see at the right, and a beautiful shell abalone necklace are being worn by the Elam Pomo women um, in the background of the painting. And Tyrone wanted to honor the extraordinary artistry of basket making that the Pomo were um, famous for and would become world famous for uh, by the end of the 19th century. And he included in his composition, you see this detail at the left and in our show, a large burden basket. But Robert Geary, who you're gonna hear from in a minute, um, pointed out the many uh, uh, artistic license moments of Tarunia. These baskets would not have been in the roundhouse. They would have been above ground for the food ceremony. We did um, a, a really uh, important overview of the history of uh, pomo basket making, um, beginning with uh, very traditional baskets that were used. Um, although they're highly and, and exquisitely decorated, these were used for food preparation, for ceremonies of, of various types. You see three beautiful examples here. And then by the late 19th century, um, the baskets made for the market as the um, collecting craze for pomo baskets um, really heated up by the end of the 19th century into the, you know, moving through the 20th century to present time. And in my final image, we, it was very important for us to have many works by Pomo artists, um, by contemporary leading Pomo artists. And this is just one example. Um, you see three baskets, woven baskets by a contemporary basket weaver, Clint McKay, and you see him on the left working. He is a member of the Dry Creek, Creek Pomo Wapo Wuntun, and um, was recently visiting us here um, as a dancer, um, a part of the um, ceremony that um, Robert Geary conducted for us at the Met with dancers and musicians. That was just an amazing event. So I'm going to end there, and I encourage you to come see our show. It will, after it closes here on uh, November 28th, it will be traveling out to the De Young Museum, where it will be near the Pomo community. That was important for us, and it opens there. Um, on December 18th and running through April 17th. And so um, I am gonna turn it, uh, things over to Robert Geary, uh, who I have the honor of introducing and who I have come to know well over several years uh, since the acquisition of the painting. He has been a constant uh, consultant and contributor to our exhibition. Robert um, is the Elam Pomo cultural leader and a regalia maker in Lake County, California. He serves as president of the Clear Lake Pomo Cultural Preservation Foundation. He's a traditional ceremonial roundhouse leader. And as I mentioned, he came to the Met uh, in late September to perform, to conduct a ceremony, the People's Dance uh, in Englehart Court. Uh, he's one of the, just a few speakers of the Elon Pomo language. And he contributed an essay to the, our exhibition publication, a Met Bulletin, and a panel for the show, among many, many other things. So I'm very pleased to introduce Robert to you tonight. Thank you. Hakate mai ohate kemtel wichen Robert Gary yahake lembak. How are you all today? My name is Robert Gary, and I'm from Alem. Honored to be here uh, to discuss and, and on the part of this panel to to have this discussion about um, this extraordinary piece of work or piece of art um, that um, was discovered uh, by the Met um, it really gives me um, great pleasure to be able to share and educate. I think uh, its content and um, you know its beauty um, that it's now being exposed to to the community or to the public. So just to give you a little background, I wanted to let you know a little bit about the Elam Pomo. Um, the Elam Pomo currently today is about two hours north of San Francisco um, in California. 
Clear Lake itself is actually the oldest um, lake in our continent in North America. Um, it's, you know, it's due to the, um, the, volcan the volcanic um, activity that's happened around the area. Um, it's able to, uh, it's been, it's given the tribe, um, you know, um, abundant resources of the area for us to flourish. Um, and the southeastern Pomo are actually all Pomo villages that were located on islands in Clear Lake. Um, the Elan Pomo was federally recognized um, in 1972. Um, we had gotten or received our federal recognition for our tribal lands. Um, as you can see inside the um, map, I want to say it's really, um, it's, I think it's on the next one, but the Aboriginal territory for the um, Elan Pomo is, is originally on, on an island uh, that is known today for um, as Rattlesnake Island. Um, today, there are seven um, tribes that are in Lake County area. And the, the current uh, land uh, size is 52 acres uh, where Elam is now located where all the houses are. The, like I said, the federal recognition um, we received in 1972. And um, the tribe has um, really flourished and really made its way um, from Lake County all the way out to the coast. The Pomo communities um, range from, um, you got coastal Pomo, you got Valley Pomo, and you got Lake Pomo. So um, due to the abundance of, of resources that were in the area, we were able to flourish. Clear Lake um, is also known, or actually known to us as Chabtin. Um, Chabtin is the southeastern um, Pomo word for the actual lake. It actually means big water. What you know gave us really a good opportunity to flourish as a community was the natural and biological resources um, because they were in such abundance. Um, also, um, what it provided, um, because Kanaktai itself was a volcano, it provided obsidian. Um, city and that was um, that we were able to to create tools and make arrowheads and uh, make knives, do those kind of things. And not only that, not only use those for our own use, but to use them as a part of our economy. Um, there were things, there were um, tribes that were in our neighboring um, er areas that we didn't really, uh, they didn't have um, obsidian. Um, so we were able to use that as a part of our, our, our trade resources. Um, also, um, in Lake County, you can actually see um, where things were uh, located on the um, upper left uh, map. Um, you can see the two. Today, we have two current um, locations for roundhouses. There's a roundhouse that is made in kind of the newer form where it's on top of the ground. And then um, there's another location where it says current roundhouse location um, where that one is actually made in the old way where it's actually inside the ground underground. Um, you can also see on the map where Tavernier's painting um, took place of the roundhouse um, that was um, erected um, when he was there. And then the location of the the actual um, Elamitian colony. You can also see next adjacent to its left is where the actual village, original village of Elim was, and that is known today as Rattlesnake Island. Um, to the right, you can see the map. It was a 1908 map from Samuel Barrett um, of known villages and campsites that were around Clear Lake. So as you can see, the lake was pretty inundated, you know, with villages and, you know, the different type, different Pomo tribes due to its abundance in, in uh, resources. Uh, on the bottom picture, you can actually see um, one of the creeks that flow into Clear Lake. Um, this was um, something that was huge. They call them, these were two species of fish. They call them hitch and chai, um, both names derived from the Pomo language. They were a big, huge, or a huge resource that got in a lot of the native communities through um, hard times um, because they were able to, you know, dry these fish and, and eat these at, you know, at a later time. And it sustained them through, you know, the harsh winters and time times when uh, food was not abundant. And so um, they're only indigenous to Clear Lake. You won't find them anywhere else. Um, due to the contamination that's happened at Clear Lake, um, it's not it's not safe uh, to eat or or gather the way that we used to, um, you know, a long time ago. So here's some um, little facts about the history of Alem, um, the southeastern Pomo. Um, language is uh, according to the uh, UC Berkeley linguist um, that we've worked with for the past 20 years that um, actually it's the southeastern Pomo is the closest branch off to Proto-Pomo. 
um, Proto Pomo is basically the language that you know all of us spoke at one time. Um, traditionally, tracts of land um, only with the southeastern Pomo um, from the beginning, from the middle of the village, kind of went out like in a in a in a in a spoke um, in, in a circle around uh, where the main village was and tracts of land were managed by actual families from their uh, matrilineal um, ancestry. Um, first uh, European or first contact in Lake County was 1833. Um, this was when life really started to change for the Eastern uh, or for the Pomo in, in general over in, in Clear Lake. Uh, many lives uh, were lost uh, due to contact um, because of you know murdering, um, enslavement, starvation, disease, or by the turn of the 1900s, California population of indigenous people were down to 16,000. So um, mining became uh, a big part of that um, because of the gold mining. From gold mining, they went to borax mining. From borax mining, um, they started you know going for sulfur, and then they started going for mercury. So mining has been a constant um, um, impact. Uh, to the community, not just the southeastern Pomo, but uh, the Pomo community that was around Clear Lake, um, because due to the contamination that happened to the lake lake's entirety, um, we were all affected. So this is a, um, a slide that shows the actual um, roundhouse that was uh, basically in ruins in 1902. Samuel Barrett was an anthropologist um, that actually went out and took these pictures. Um, this is what was left during the time even though um, the house was falling in, the tribe was still um, doing uh, ceremonies, still conducting ceremonies um, in the before roundhouses had actually taken place or were introduced to the community. They were um, actually doing ceremonies in, in um, arbors, arbor type um, situations just made for those. So they kind of went back to that for a little while and waited for the next um, next person that actually saw the vision of, of the next roundhouse. And so uh, when that happened, a new one was constructed and uh, dances started being held in those again. The roundhouse um, had its continuance in the community of Lim. Uh, you can see on it, well, in the past slide that it was in 1902 where the ruins were happening. And due to, um, you know, a lot of the things that were going on in California, like I said, the mining, um, the missions um, affected us. Um, enslavement, um, loss of land, loss of language, a lot of those things um, really hindered us to be able to continue to do ceremonies. Um, Elem did um, continue to do those in a secret society type ceremonies um, where, you know, they were being held um, and where no one would see them. Um, the people wouldn't be uh, disciplined for continuing the continuance of those, but we did keep it going. Um, as you can see, um, the roundhouse in the 1930s um, that was constructed after the 19, um, after the uh, Tavern Years um, roundhouse painting, um, roundhouse had you know completely um, fell in. Um, then the 1930s, which was constructed I, um, from according to our elders, they were saying like in the mid 20s, was constructed, and that went on until the until the 1950s. Uh, from the 50s, um, late 60s, um, another one was constructed due to um, a new a new dreamer, a new person that's seen a vision, um, and that went on until about 1978. Um, and then that one um, was 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 done. And then there was another one that was seen. And that's where we're at today. Um, the 2021 roundhouse that we have. And like I said, we do have two locations for the roundhouse. They have one that's actually built on top of the ground. And then there's one that's built in the old in the old way that's built under the ground. Um, one of the things to, we, that we always kept um, going was to make sure that ceremony always happened. Our, our elders and we made sure that the knowledge and, and the rules and the protocols that went to ceremonies were always passed down. Um, that's one reputation I know that Elim has. Um, good reputation that we have is just making sure that we held on to those and that those are, are, are taught and passed down from generation to generation. As you can see um, in the night, early 1900s, um, the regalia that was used um, and the ceremony that we did in 2021, there's really not too much difference, um, but the protocols and the rules and, and the processes for how those things are done um, are still followed today. Uh, the continuance of traditional and cultural knowledge. Um, the thousands of years, um, a lot of the cultural knowledge um, in gathering food, um, using our environment, and making sure um, the traditional ways of, of um, making regalia are still being followed. 
we do um, annual trips, you know, to the coast um, to gather food, traditional foods, um, places where we could have been passed down from generation to generation as far as um, areas to gather from. Um, those things are still being taught. Um, how to make regalia, those things are being taught. Um, and just the, like I said, you know, understanding of the environment and what it provides for us and how to use those things. And so a lot of those things are still um, happening today. And, you know, we're, we're, we're fortunate. We're fortunate due to all the impacts and um, all the adversities that happen to the community, that that knowledge is still being passed down. I wanted to say thank you. Um, this is my family. Um, I like to always give thanks to you know my my mother and my father, and uh, to my family for the continued hard work that they do um, with the valuable traditional knowledge that's being passed down, not only from myself, but from a lot of different communities, a lot of different um, traditional leaders um, to their next generation. Um, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity, Betsy. Thank you so much, uh, Robert. That was wonderful. Uh, and we, we still are just um, celebrating your presence here at the Met in late September with your family and fellow musicians and dancers. Now it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce Mio Marufo, who is an Eastern Pomo artist and curator from the Clear Lake Basin. She has focused her work on cultural arts, regalia making, and traditional foods and cooking techniques. Mio, along with Robert, served as a really critical voice in a video that was created for our exhibition, which you can access on the Met Museum's exhibition page for the show, and I highly recommend it. Uh, uh, Mio is just amazing on this video, as is Robert, but I, it's my pleasure to introduce her this evening. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us this evening or this afternoon where we are. My name again is Mio Marufo. I wanted to uh, fully introduce myself, I guess. I am Eastern Pomo from the Clear Lake Basin. I work for the Guineaville Rancheria, which is a Valley Pomo. And I am the Central California um, representative for US EPA Region 9, as well as the California State Representative for US EPA. And I say these things because I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Superfund site. And I wanted to let you know that I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so we're gonna talk a little bit about Pomo Country first. I know that Robert just gave us a lot of information, uh, ELIM specific, and a lot of background information. Um, there are 26 Pomo tribes in the three California counties. County of Lake, Mendocino County, and Sonoma County. Uh, personally, we group more like Lake Pomo, Valley Pomo, and Coast Pomo. And so you can see that we're up here in the northwestern quadrant of California. Um, next slide, please. So we have seven distinct dialects, uh, which are being revitalized or still in use today. Within the large dialect areas, there are different accents, um, much like America, where you say potato, we say potato, we say biche, they say bushe across the lake. So um, we have those same things. There are actually different root origins of uh, Pomo languages. So the Kashaya Pomo, which are in the southwestern region, will sound more like the Hopi, whereas the eastern Pomo would sound more like Athabascan. So it's pretty interesting about the root origins that we have. You would think that we'd all be seeing, saying the same thing, but we don't. We're very different. So the Lake Pomo, we have eastern Pomo and we have southeastern Pomo. We also have visitors from the Wapo, Lake Miwok, and Patwin tribes. There are currently seven federally recognized tribes. And back when Tavonier came, there would have been many more villages around the lake. But with the coming of non-natives, our people were forced into smaller rancherias. So prior to Tavonier, there were probably at least 30 villages known around the lake. And those are 30 large villages. Um, our our rancheria sizes and our reservation sizes, our tribal sizes, uh, range anywhere from 
200 to 1500 plus. So there's a bunch of different little tribes around this lake. So the Sulphur Bank Mercury Mine. So why am I gonna talk about the Sulphur Bank uh, Superfund site? Because as noted in the other presentations, a very important component of this painting is not only the living culture pictured, but it's also a represents a change in time. But first a word about Clear Lake, Har Habitin, or C, oh, how did you pronounce it, Bob? Habitin. <laughs> They, they swallow their A's. <laughs> Clear Lake is the largest body of fresh water fully within the state of California. It is a eutrophic lake, which means that it's constantly moving and full of nutrients and life. It's a, considered a shallow lake. Um, its average depth is about 28 feet. However, due to the volcanic nature, there are some spots that don't have a depth. The Pomo of Lake County are known for our feather baskets, and we're known for our feather baskets because of the amount of birds that live off of the lake. So pictured here is California to Lake County to Clear Lake, and this is just a portion of Clear Lake. And it's a 150 acre Superfund site of an abandoned open pit mercury mine. Approximately 2 million cubic yards of mine waste are located on the property. And that's the current number. A lot of waste has been removed, but this is still a huge number, which is the reasoning for it being a super fun site. When you come from a distance, this mine is eye-catching. The blue waters look inviting. You would never know the contamination levels of this mine. The mine tailings and the waste contaminated more than just the direct surrounding lands. Due to the volcanic nature of Clear Lake, the contamination has slowly seeped out of the mine over time. And this has affected the amount of fish that can be eaten and the basketry plants that were used. The funding of the sulfur bank mine changed the composition of our lake. So when you look at this picture, it's absolutely beautiful. Clear Lake itself is really a beautiful place, but when you catch the mine at a certain time, it looks like a jewel pool that could be in somebody's backyard. However, as you get closer to it, um, you can see the different areas. Um, you can see the white edges around the water um, that's all contamination as well as in that water. The Alem Indian colony actually sits up to the right where it's, it's, you can't really see it in this particular map, but you can at the bottom right hand map. So here's some pictures from the mine. So by amount of fish consumption that I said, I mean a half a pound of fish only once a month. This is the difference between a fish people and an acorn people. This is, means it's a total entire change of food source. So in Bob's presentation, Robert's presentation, he showed the indigenous fish of Clear Lake, which is the hitch. And the hitch used to come up the streams. They spawn much like a salmon. So they used to come up the streams by the thousands. So that picture that he showed, the old black and white, was not actually a picture of a catch that they just drew out. That's actually the fish coming up the stream. That is how thick the fish would come up. The contamination also affected the basket materials that were gathered. My people are basket people. We cook with baskets, we store in baskets, our houses are made from basket materials. When you take a basket people that weave with the materials of the lake, and when that lake becomes contaminated, the weaving changes, the way we weave changes. No more processing roots with our mouth, no more gathering in slow moving waters, um, which is really hard because our roots grow in slow moving waters. And what I mean by slow moving is, I don't mean stagnant water. Our lake is constantly moving. 
And so there is no true stopped water. But what it does is it slowly moves around. There's a current that moves around, which is how the contamination spreads, is because that current slowly moves around the entirety of the lake. So all 100 miles around our lake, that current takes that contamination around. It just, as you put a drop of co food coloring in a glass, you can just see it dissipates with the more movement there is. So this is the Clear Lake. This is Hobbiton. This is Clear Lake. This is 100 miles all the way around. And this, imagine if you will, seeing this pristine. And you would have marshes where it says Clear Lake Oaks and Clear Lake, those would be large tule marshes with herds of tule elk roaming. Over in the northern part of the lake, those were marshes also, but there was deeper holes for open fishing. Over where it says Lakeport, there would be marshlands there, and there was at least seven different tribal villages in that area only. All around this lake, there were 30 plus villages. And each one of these areas has a huge amount of birds. It has a huge amount of waterfowl. There's many different types of species that live there that we lived off of. If you look to the top right, there's the Tavonier painting. And that, that arrow goes down to where Elim is. And that is where the Superfund site is at the bottom. This painting for all of its cultural value and for everything wonderful that it shows of our people is also documenting a period in time where our lake changed and the culture of our weaving, the culture of who we are managed to survive that. And I'm very proud of our people for doing that for surviving. I mean, you heard Bob earlier to earlier in his presentation. He still speaks the language. His family still dances. We all still dance. And we've survived. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mio, for that wonderful presentation. And um, I had the pleasure of visiting Clear Lake and um, uh, actually learned a lot this evening, uh, a great deal more about the area. But now it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce Patricia Marquin Norby, who is uh, Parapacha. And she recently joined the American Wing staff um, at the Metropolitan Museum as our inaugural associate curator of Native American art. Dr. Norby has brought her extensive expertise in Native American history and visual culture to our museum and to the American Wing and has a special interest in indigenous communities and environmental conflict. And I'm especially grateful to her for joining us tonight. It was her birthday yesterday, I think, and she's uh, traveling. So it, it's, it's really wonderful of you to make the time for us this evening. Thank you. Nari Hamashak, hello. Thank you, Mio, Robert, Betsy, and everyone joining us today. I would like to say that as a Pudapacha woman, I'm a guest here in the homelands of the Wabanaki people where I'm joining you tonight. I'm incredibly honored to be sharing this time with all of you. And I'm going to say a few words before we move into the question and answer segment of this program. This exhibition is quite special for many reasons and especially for the reasons Mio, Robert and Betsy have shared tonight but also because it's so, it is so strongly grounded by community, collaboration, and place. Curating Native American and Indigenous art within a Western colonial institution is truly a unique challenge that not only considers Indigenous as well as Western aesthetics, it must also foreground Native American and Indigenous voices and perspectives while following Indigenous cultural and political protocols. This exhibition does all of these things quite well. It also powerfully reflects upon the past while bringing us into contemporary context, which as Mio and Robert have shared, is critical when placing Native American art on view. As a curator of Native American art, I wanna say that this exhibition gives me a sense of hope 
because it honestly and sensitively presents these important histories and urgent environmental issues to a wide audience. And in this way, it is truly a gift to the world. Additionally, I'm, policed, I'm pleased to share that this project strongly aligns with our current approach to presenting Native American art at the Met, specifically in the American wing, where many exciting changes are happening. For instance, as part of the current Art of Native America rotation, we removed a map that was part of the 2018 exhibition and replaced it with this active land and water statement. This statement goes beyond standard land acknowledgements. This new active statement affirms how we will move forward inclusive of indigenous voices and experiences according to kinship ties to homelands and ecological issues, many of which Miu and Robert have presented about this evening. Installed alongside the statement is Shinnecock artist Courtney Leonard's Scrimshaw Study 2021, which explores Northeastern indigenous ceramic traditions and environmental issues that impact the Shinnecock Nation's ancestral lands along Long Island. And so we're highlighting works that reflect community connections as well as ecological and intergenerational knowledge that are part of creative practices which help sustain cultural identity and assert sovereignty. The detail of this whale tooth created by Courtney Leonard includes two whales that are swimming in New York Harbor. Well, one of them is actually flying next to the Statue of Liberty. This is an expression of hope by Courtney. And this was part of a story um, at the beginning of the pandemic, the first summer of the pandemic, when whales were spotted returning to New York Harbor. Whales are considered sac sacred to uh, the Shinnecock community. And so Courtney wanted to, to mark this moment in time. On the reverse of the whale tooth is a portrait of the current Secretary of the Interior, Deborah Halland, whose presence um, as the Secretary of Interior has brought exciting changes and hope for many indigenous communities, specifically in regard to environmental issues. This is another work by Courtney Leonard titled Contact 2021, which will be on view in the 2022 rotation of Art of Native America. It includes hundreds of handmade ceramic shells that cradle images significant to the Shinnecock community. The shells are hand tied to a clay canvas surface created with clay that is hand harvested from ancestral lands. The composition creates a map-like image referencing Shinnecock homelands and the sacredness of whales and water to the community. This intergenerational relationship with local natural materials is something we see again and again within indigenous art practices. It is a powerful aesthetic approach that is strongly present in the Jules Tavernier and the Elam Pomo exhibition. To close, I would like to share an excerpt from our current land and water statement because it directly connects with this truly meaningful exhibition. We understand that these items are vibrant expressions of native sovereignty, identity, and connections to community and family. They embody intergenerational environmental knowledge, including origin stories, languages, songs, dances, and ties to homelands. We commit to pursuing continuous collaborations with indigenous communities and present Native American art in a manner that is inclusive of indigenous perspectives, involves guidance from source communities, and creates space for respectful listening and thoughtful dialogue. We will work to advance indigenous experiences in the Met's exhibitions, collections, and programs. Moreover, we will strengthen our awareness of historical and contemporary environmental issues in the New York region and throughout North America in order to thoughtfully reckon with our institutional legacy and its impact on the lands, waters, and original peoples of this place. They are, and will always be, inextricable. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patricia. We're so thrilled to have you um, at the Met and uh, really enjoyed your presentation. And now um, we you know, turn to a, a question and answer. Um, I might uh, start with one question and then we'll, um, I encourage you, you know, our audience to uh, uh, add questions to our Q&A 
Uh, we already have several there, but I'd like to begin with a question for, you know, perhaps for both Robert and Neo. Um, one of the th many things I learned, because, you know, as we've all touched on, this exhibition was done in consultation with, you know, all of you today, but, you know, a, a whole series of um, Elam Pomo consultants, um, other indigenous uh, historians, and we learned so much about um, the painting uh, through our interactions with you. And the thing that I think I was most touched by when I, you know, was that I, in looking at the architecture of the roundhouse and the way that Cabernet presented it in that beautiful circular and very intricate constructed form was that it was um, intended to replicate a basket. And the minute I heard that, it just added a whole layer of significance um, to the painting for me. So either one of you or both of you could perhaps, ex you know, explain that maybe better than I have. <laughs> yeah. You know, these were stories that were just passed down from our elders from generation to generation and the reasoning um, when that had came. And I think that one was the biggest, um, you know, the, the biggest revelation, I think, for us, always knowing that that's what it was. And that kind of tells you, like, how important basketry was to the Pomo people, or to just to the indigenous people around the area, how important basketry was, and um, what it did for us. Um, and it held it, like, you know, Mia was talking about earlier, you know, we stored, we used it for ceremony, you know, we used it, you know, to, to cook, we, um, in every aspect of, of you know, uh, our lives, um, a basket was there. And so it just is fitting to know that even for the protection of its people, that's what was going to protect the people was a basket. So, um, you know, and from, you know, just the stories that we were told and on, on what it represents um, and, and what it is, um, it, it shows you and it kind of tells you that, you know, that it still has that strength um, to do, um, you know, the, the unthinkable, which is to protect um, a community as a whole. And so, um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, that was something that's really, you know, profound, um, which a lot of people don't think about, um, about baskets. Right. No, it's, it's an amazing, um, you know, piece of information to know. And, and we actually, I had the, the great privilege of seeing the present day roundhouse with you, Robert. And it's, it's an experience that is very hard to describe. And, um, uh, but I see that we have a question from our audience that might be for Mio. Um, if you want to unmute yourself, Mio, it's um, our audience members asking, uh, when you say that some parts of Clear Lake due to volcanic activity, I'm not sure if this is Robert or Mio, don't have a depth, do you mean it is unmeasured or simply very shallow? I mean that it's unmeasured. So there are areas, because it's a volcano, Mount Kanakai is, is considered a inactive volcano. Actually, it's considered an active volcano because of the geysers right on the side of it. But um, there are volcanic shoots that do not have any depth. Clear Lake has actually, as you go down the way, there's different portions of of this whole system of lakes. So there's Clear Lake, there's um, what we call Mud Lake, and then there's Blue Lake. Those, so across from where I live is Blue Lake, and it's, it's like some areas of Clear Lake. In 1972 and in 1992, they sent down oceanography equipment to Blue Lakes, and they did not find a depth because that's how far it goes down. Wow. So what I mean is no, no depth. Huh. That's great. We have another complicated but very pertinent question. How have the curator and the POMO dealt with interpretive text for this exhibition? Who has written it? How do you deal with the historic section in which the artwork doesn't dominate? And I should begin by saying that I curated this show with my colleague, Shannon Vittoria, and she will be doing a program um, on basket making in November, so stay tuned. Uh, but I can answer this question. We worked with, well, Robert, of course, um, a number of POMO consultants who were invited to write labels for the exhibition, um, Robert contributed an essay in the catalog, and 
For some of the other paintings by Cabernet that were painted across the plains, uh, we invited um, Arthur Amiot, an Oglala Lakota scholar and historian to write the label. We invited um, the granddaughter of Red Cloud to write a label. And even in our Hawaiian section, um, we invited a native Hawaiian scholar to write the label. So that was one way where we could give a, an important voice uh, to our indigenous consultants. But one of the most dominant aspects of our final gallery is the extraordinary video where Robert and Mio are stars in this incredible video, along with Sherry Smith Ferry, who is a, a basket expert. So in every possible way, we um, we were uh, consulting with, you know, what we would put in the show, even what the title of the show would be and, you know, what the focus would be. So I feel like we, we you know, achieved a goal and maybe, you know, um, we could have gone even further, but I feel like it, it is just imbued with, you know, the voices of Elon Pomo consultants. And um, so I think I that kind of answers the question. Do you, do you have anything else to add, Robert or Neo? To, okay. Well, we have another interesting question about the Superfund site. Are there any plans for cleanup of the Superfund site that may allow the waters and soils to one day be used by your communities again? Or has too much permanent damage already been done? So the waters and the soils are still being used by the communities. And there's no getting, if you live next to a lake, you have to use that lake. So there's no getting around the use of it. The soils have been mitigated to try and cap uh, some of the, the larger contaminated areas or remove them. There's been an awful lot of soil that's been removed. Um, the sulfur bank mercury mine is called a super fun because once a uh, area reaches a status where so much money has to be put towards it from EPA, it becomes a super fun site, meaning there are millions of dollars that are going to be designated for the cleanup of that site. The problem with our site and many of the other ones across uh, the United States is that we are volcanic and so there is no true capping or removal because all of the little fissures that are in in the earth that let the water seep out from the contaminated site into the regular site. We're trying a couple of different ways to do it. They're capping with clay because clay has movement. Um, they're trying some other ways to do it, but Damage has been done. All we're trying to do is mitigate that damage and lower so that our, our water standards become higher again. Thank you, Mio. And this is a, a really interesting question that I've thought about, and it may have to be our last question of the night because uh, we're getting on to seven o'clock. But it might, maybe Robert could begin with an answer, and, and Mio, you might have something to add. But um, so the question is, how has the contamination of Clear Lake impacted the bird populations that use it as their habitat? And what has that meant for the creation of regalia and other art? Well, as far as I think with the contamination, it, it, it's hard because like, you know, when it comes to regalia um, and, and not just regalia, but consumption, um, a lot of the fowl that we used to use um, and eat, like we can't. We can't anymore. And so once, you know, a lot of those practices aren't being practiced anymore, then also the knowledge um, from that next generation, because they're not using it, is lost. So, um, you know, there's there's a lot of the regalia that the uh, regalia and even like a, a lot of the basketry um, feathers um, we're lucky because they're, you know, most of those are not waterfowl. So a lot of those uh, birds are like inland, not saying that they don't make their way to, you know, to the, to the lake, you know, to eat on, you know, bugs that come from there. But, um, you know, they're not as effective, affected, I think, as far as the waterfowl that actually, you know, live in the lake, you know, eat from the lake and, you know, all of those things. So, I mean, we're still um, in kind of like a bad or a, a really bad situation as far as 
um, being able to still obtain a lot of, you know, those birds for regalia. But, um, you know, we still have means and, you know, there's other tribes that we actually, the neighboring tribes um, that are in different areas we trade with um, to be able to get a lot of those, those feathers as well. Well, thank you, Robert. Let's hear from Mio, please. The loss of our bird population isn't based off of the contamination of the lake. The loss of our bird population is based off of the non-natives that have over-harvested in that lake. So when every building that goes up, mm. it creates less of a habitat for our, our bird life. You know, the birds that Bob is describing, yeah, they don't, they don't go directly into the lake. And so they're secondary users of that lake. But it's the it's the populations that have come in and taken down the habitat that is the worst for us. Thank you. Yeah, not just build, not, not just buildings, but the wind turbines. A lot of those things that are now starting to make its way into Lake County. Oh, are they on the lake, Robert? The wind turbines. Uh, the wind turbines. That, well, there's plans on them entering okay. into to the county. So, I mean, wow. that's going to be you know a big impact. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. We're so pleased um, to have you with us tonight, Robert, Neo, and Patricia. And thank you to our audience for your great questions. And please come and see the show. Uh, so good night, everyone. <laughs>